Hey, everyone. Hi. Hello. Welcome to another exciting episode of Allison Rosen is your new best friend. I am overjoyed to welcome back to the show someone that you guys know and love and someone that I know well, which makes it so easy for me because I can pretty much just coast and you know I have become very lazy. I'm just very tired. It's a bad way to start a show. But first, I need to catch up with the bad boy of podcasting, producer Tony Thaxton. Hello, Tony. How's it going? It's going all right, Allison. How are you? Well, oh, I like the way you're talking. It's yeah, a I don't fun know what new that was. <laughs> Remember last night when we recorded a show? Now that's in real time. When they hear it, there will have been a few days between it. When I paused for a drop and then you just didn't play it because mm-hmm. you just didn't want me to think that I could depend on you. Yeah, that's part of my bad boy persona. <laughs> It really was. It really threw me for quite a loop. I'm still thinking about it. <laughs> I hope you slept. I did. I okay. did. But I had nightmares where I was waiting for people to play drops and no one played drops. And I, then I was a toddler in a crib and I was like, play the drops. Mission accomplished. <laughs> Allison, Rosen, Allison's your new best friend. Anyway, um, last night we recorded a Thursday show. Again, I'm letting them behind the curtain and they're seeing the timeline with Nick Weiger of Doughboys and John Gabris of many podcasts. And it was really, really fun. I thought it was a good one. Yeah, I agree. Uh, That was, uh, yeah, I'm a big Doughboys fan. So uh, I always like having those guys. And Gabris is basically like the third Doughboy. Yeah. He's toured with them and everything. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why I said that. What's what's with the way I speak this afternoon? I don't know what's going on here. I don't know, Tony. That's really for you to answer, not me. What's going on? I I don't know. I feel all wound up for some reason. I don't know what's going on. Have you had a lot of coffee? No, no more than usual. Um, Is it because you're excited for Halloween? Yeah, that's it. (laughs) Is it Uh, because it's a it's a, a a rare Tuesday afternoon recording? It, it, it maybe that might be some of it. It definitely uh, is a little. It's definitely very out of character for us, uh, at least for a very long time. I know. Uh, and uh, I kept forgetting that this was happening today. Oh, really? And here we are. Yeah, here we are. Well, you made it on time and everything. Um, the thing about the show last night, which by the time they hear this, they will have heard, is that I shared something, and I started by saying, "I know this is not going to make me look good." And then I shared it anyway. And I, as we record this, we're in a special time where I haven't yet seen people's reaction. And I'm making it sound like I shared like some, like, oh, I, it's not murder or anything like that. It's pretty minor, all things considered. Just a, like so, a, a, an exchange between Daniel and me. And then a few gentle scripts I've provided him with so that we can avoid this particular triggering exchange. But I'm just afraid most people are going to think I'm crazy, like I'm at the drop, A, and B, they're going to side with Daniel. What do you think, Tony? I mean, this is a risk you uh, were willing to take by bringing this story up. So so that means I mean, you think that that's the case? I, 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 I don't know. I, I could see. I think there's some middle ground to be fine. I mean, I think that's kind of what we got at last night was that. I think that, you know, there's so, there's somewhere in the middle for both of you to meet, but mostly you're in the wrong. <laughs> you are, you are so close. You are so close. No, no, no. No, yeah, I, I, I stand by there. Some, some, some middle ground. Well, that is the kind of diplomacy I'm not looking for from you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, let's welcome to the show producer, writer, Former regular on the Thursday show of Allison Rosen is your new best friend, someone that everyone associates with avocados. It is Greg Hello. Heller. Yay, that's me. I'm, I'm, hi. Hello, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Tony. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. And thank you guys for your patience because last we had an aborted um, record because I could not find the dongle. So this is actually our second attempt to do this. So thank you both for your patience. We had a dong. It's you know the irony, given that your screen name is Dong Attack. I I was having the same thought. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I will say um, I'm almost positive my son took the dongle, and I did like a lineup with him last night, where I took like a couple of dongles and like some cables, and I held them in front of him, and I was like, "Do any of these look familiar?" 
you know where any of these are? And he just grabbed at one of them and shoved it in his mouth. But I have some feeling like I'm going to find it in his nursery or something in a couple of weeks as car keys and stuff have been located there. Right. So that is my strong suspicion is that it has been stolen by an 18 month old. Did you uh, end up having to, so you had to purchase an, a new dongle. I did. I had to go to the app. I, first of all, like they should just rename these things. It's so stupid. Yeah. You know, some things, Tony, you're giving a levels are alarming face. Are levels alarming? No, no, no. I was, okay, I was, okay. I was making a note. Okay. Um, you know, some things have a name that like, in order to say them, you have to suffer like a hack, a hack joke. Mm-hmm. There's no way to say them and get by that part of it. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. I'm trying to think of other examples and I can't think of any, but dongle is and definitely I know there, one. I know there are other examples of this. I don't know. Well, Tony, I, can you think of any? Where like, you don't want to say something because you know a joke has to be made about it. Right. Like, like, uh. Like basically how sometimes, you know, even again, so hacky, but sometimes those that's what she says can be a little <laughs> tempting. They, oh, they're very tempting. In fact, my wife and my wife used to be a that's what she said person. And we like 10 years ago, I said, like, every time you say that's what she said from now on, you have to put a thousand dollars in my bank account. <laughs> <laughs> and as far as I know, from that moment going forward, she never said it. Wow. I've never heard. And I bait her all the time. Any chance I get in, she just looks at me every time and goes, I'm not going to say it. I don't say it anymore. I'm never going to say it. <laughs> so it was, that might not have been the bet. The bet might've been that I gave her money. If I can't remember what the bet was, but in any event I lost. So I don't like the word dongle is what I'm saying, because you say it and like, you have to look up and someone's going to have to say something about it. I think they should just call it adapter. Maybe, right? Yes. But anyway, yes. <laughs> we are connected via fresh dongle. We are. Yes, it, we are. Is there, are there two windows right in front of you? What's happening? There's like all sorts of sunbursts all over your face and it's not a bad yeah, look, but I'm flanked by windows on either side. Actually. I mean, this is the bedroom of our new house. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the walls are still like unadorned and stuff. And we have this mirror on the side, but yeah, like I'm just flanked by mirrors. Do I look okay? <laughs> well, the lighting is good in here, isn't it? Are you, do do you I just not... look like I'm in an eighties, like a noir film? Mm, yeah. It's a little like arty. A... Like a poorly. Like, do I look like I'm in a Nagel? Yes. Good. Yes. You look like you're in a Nagel. Like someone. Um, Go ahead. In any event, dongle has been, new dongle has, multiple dongles were purchased so that this does not happen again. Dongle Old dongle have not, has not been located. Multiple dongles is what? It's not. It's not. It is. That's, that's one of the things, Allison. I can't that's help one, it. That's one of the things. I can't help. It's like saying octopus and then an uncle or a cousin or someone is going to have to say octopi. That's one of the things. I did it. And, you know, they actually changed it so that the, the accepted plural now is octopuses. I didn't know that. Did you know that? And, and I believe they changed it to avoid this exact conversation. I believe. I believe. Um, so my friend. I'm very high on coffee right now. My friend worked. <laughs> Extremely high on coffee. So is Tony, even though he's lying about it. My friend worked on a TV <laughs> show. And we're going to get into why you're here in a moment. But. Yeah, that's fine. He had a pass and it was like Studio B, but he had a pass that said Stud B on it or something. And our, mm-hmm. it's Bill Schultz. He's been on this show before. And I remember I made the like Stud joke. Oh, like um, I forget the stupid joke I made. And he goes like, never heard that before. <laughs> and I felt like I wanted to walk into the ocean because it's like, of course, he's heard every variation of anything you can say that like your, your sticker says stud on it. It's sort of the same as like Dan, you know, stud finders for the wall. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh God. You have to put it on yourself and the thing goes off or yeah. it's not working or like it's working so well. Yeah. I know that fucking garbage. There's an executive at who used to be at some of the, some network, I don't know whose name is Chachi. Mm-hmm. And I was pitching him one time with an, a writing partner who shall remain unnamed and like 10 minutes into the pitch, he made a joke about loving Joni. Yeah. I bet Chachi and has never heard that. the room just went completely silent. Nobody laughed. And we all just sat there for a minute. And I was like, fuck, we're not selling this show. <laughs> and then after the meeting, I said something to the unnamed person. And he was like, I, I will regret that for the rest of my life. <laughs> just, but he said like something in, instinctively happened in his brain and he like had to do it. Mm. You know, like if someone says hams or whatever, you have to say the beer refreshing afterwards. You know this instinct? No. Anyway, it's this old <laughs> commercial shit. But my point is that you have to like he, say it to yourself in your brain, but then try not to say it out loud. Yeah. I think that's the key. Yeah. yeah. Stud finder is very difficult. 
I have one of those in the house too. And I sometimes want to put it on my own chest, but do you do ever do the knock on wood and then knock on your head? No. Do you do that, Tony? No, I don't even know that I've seen anybody yeah. do that. What is that? Explain. You know, when you're saying like, you know, th- it's been a great, well, you wouldn't say that in this year, but you know, some other year, it's been a great year, knock on wood. And then I just. Well, thank you for clarifying that you wouldn't say it in this year. Though. <laughs> yeah. That really helped with the example because we were both about to jump in and be like, but it hasn't. Yeah. <laughs> Your um, example doesn't track. YouTube.com slash Allison Rosen to see the light all over Greg's Nagel face and uh, me knocking on my head. Yeah, no, I'm a knock on wood and then I'll knock on something and then I'll be like, oh, I don't even think that's wood. But I don't actually take to knocking on my head. But some people, that's a, their go to move. Mm, yeah, I, f- I don't buy it. It's not good. I feel like mm-hmm. I need to take this moment also to remind you both that there was a famous singer named Tony Braxton. Oh, so you get that all? Yeah, I know you yeah. get that. Thank, yeah, not as much. Oh these days, God, but, yeah. geez, you know what? I've never even thought about that. That has to suck. Like, does that <laughs> just suck every day? Does it suck every day? It doesn't happen nearly as much as it used to. But uh, right. But did you just get your heart unbroken like once a day when you <laughs> everywhere you went? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. As like, I as I always tell people too, I was. It, she became popular as I was also the new kid and as a freshman in high school, the new kid in school also. So uh, great combo. Uh, so what would happen? Yeah. Would people sing her songs at you? No, it was like, it was never mean. It was just annoying. Like, it was just like, literally, they would hear my name and they go, what? Tony Braxton? And, <laughs> you know, that's literally it. But it's just, you know, every time it's like, yeah, I've never heard that. Yeah, it's rough. That's rough. So rough. we have, um, I, I'm on Patreon. Tony, do it, do it, do it. Don't Patreon. do this. <laughs> 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 I'm on Patreon. Patreon. Fine. Patreon.com slash Allison Rosen. And uh, all sorts of rewards. But one of them is that you can submit questions to my guests. And one of the frequent questioners who she submits very good questions is Whitney C. And everyone is like, oh, Whitney Cummings? And they oh, all. You also have. That's a regular. You also have joke. a super fan who has the same name as like an iconic porn star, right? Yes. I'm blanking right now. But Nina, I can't remember if it's a man or a not woman. Nina. What is her name? Nina. Nina Hartley. Yes. Yes. You have a fan named Nina Hartley, and that's the name of like a, like a grandma porn woman. Grandma oh, yeah. porn? I, 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 I somehow, yeah. This sounds weird, but I feel like I stumbled into this no, information she, recently. Right. But I don't right, remember yeah. how. <laughs> no, the algorithm will find you, Tony. <laughs> but she's, she's like an old porn woman. I don't know if this is bullshit. I probably shouldn't say this no, mean. share this. I I think this is... Is it okay to say someone is old? Yeah. Um, She's an old porn lady. Wait, I need clarification. When you say grandma porn, like, oh, I'm into old people having sex, or she was making, she's like vintage porn. She an older lady (laughs) doing it? What are we talking about? She's a, she's a woman in her, she's in a woman of advanced years. But I don't know, I think she might have been in getting railed. I think she might have been in porn, like, from when she was really like when she was normal or young. I see. She's still normal. I don't know. This is a dangerous, dangerous territory. So I don't know a ton about her, but you have a fan who has the same. So it's like she's got to be a giant bummer. Like Betty White or Angela Lansbury. Like at one point they were young, but we know them as (laughs) ladies of advanced age. This is also who this porn star is for. Yeah, but I don't know enough about her to know if she was like famous porn before she got old again we're gonna get to why you're here in a moment but can we talk about tentacle porn for a moment we can talk about it for like a couple of hours i just don't i don't have that i don't know that much about it i know barely anything about it but i saw (laughs) what'd you say (laughs) no i i I, hold on hold on googling (laughs) <laughs> oh, I, was, I didn't know I was like are you going to play a drop what's going on <laughs> I think Greg is googling something tentacle erotica yeah. tentacle erotica is or tentacle rape yikes is a type of pornography most commonly found in Japan which integrates traditional <laughs> pornography with elements of bestiality and a fantasy horror or science fiction theme I guess you just get boned by tentacles is that what happened so I saw a, clicking any of these other links a drawing yes? like I don't know if it was m- Ma- is it manga manga Ma- I, I, I like i think it's actually manja i think it was manja of what i saw um of a 
girl with some kind of tentacled sea creature on her face. And my question is, is, are there actual adult films of actual humans and things with tentacles? Or is this just all uh, animated? You guys would know, right? Uh, (laughs) uh, What does that Google search say? I really don't know the answer to that. I am looking at some images of this. Wait, it's called hentai, uh, right? I can tell very quickly that I don't have this fetish. (laughs) I don't have whatever this is. I don't have it. Um, Some of these squid or whatever, I could see them tasting good. But I don't like have any desire to do anything physical or watch anything physical happen with them. This is not for me. Yeah, that's enough. Tony, tentacle porn. <laughs> yeah, I I can't say I've seen it, and I have to assume it's not for me. Yeah, not for me. It's occurring to me that I should address the listener directly. Please don't send me anything. Please don't send me moving <laughs> pictures. Please don't send me stupid. I don't want any images. And if you're gonna provide me with information. Do it in the least creepy way possible, please. Thank you. Okay. So for months now, Greg has been telling me that he is going to be on a podcast and this podcast is going to crush my podcast. It will crush you. That's right. One of my favorite things you sent me was a a gif or a gif. I say gif of a little girl crushing a can. The crush. And again, youtube.com slash Austin Rosen where you can see Greg making the crush maneuver um so he's threatened me with crushing for <clears throat> how many months do you think it's been now i mean i think i would say some of the early threats might have been as far back as late 2020 yeah i think that's when we first started discussing like production of this thing so it's been like we're coming up on 10 months of a like a imminent crush right and this is not one of these like shitty we just talk about tentacle porn and light flares and throw it up on the internet and come what may this is like an, a professional produced podcast that i'm going to get crushed by i don't even stand a chance yeah your odds are not good no um do you, so do you want me to talk about what it is sure or do you want to talk about what it is well um i could talk a little bit about it and then i'll ask you some questions okay that's fine thank you um so it is a <laughs> podcast called close to death and it, uh, I do have some questions about it, but I listened, Greg, you're on two episodes and I think you produced these episodes as well. And I listened to them and they were great. co-produced. There were other producers. I did. I did all the writing. So tell me about I, this podcast. That's going to crush mine and tell me about how you got involved. Okay. Um, so I knew one of the first executives who started developing this. And I think I, think I know her to- as well. Do you, perhaps, you know, it's Jessica is who we're talking about. Yeah. Remember she worked yeah. on. Uh, yes, a project that yes. never never went anywhere because we were That's ahead correct. of our time. That's correct. <laughs> um, and I think they were they were partnered with uh, Paul Feig's company to make this, and another company called Transmitter. And I think they were originally just going to ask me to consult on it. Mm-hmm. And then uh, because what they wanted to do is they wanted to find kind of a comedic way to talk to people who deal with death every day, and the other people on it are all comics. It's a, a comic named Mary Beth Baroni. Barone, do you know her? I know the name. I don't know her. I don't know if I'm saying her last name right. Another comic named Jordan Fisher and Francesca Fiorentini. So it's all people who like do this, who are comics, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and they started talking to me about it. And then um, I started telling them about my relationship with death and I, I think I told them the story about finding a dead person when I was a kid. And then it sort of shifted into like, oh, maybe you should be in this. Um, so at that point, I just sort of like became one of the hosts. I think I don't think I was part of the original plan. That's like what happened but- with you came over when I was recording the Thursday show one night because you wanted to observe because we were going to try to produce something. And then I'm like, if you're going to be here, you have to get on mic. And then you were so good on mic. You started being mm-hmm. on mic all the time. Look at yeah, you, maybe Paul this the is, Heller. This is perhaps my plan. Maybe this is how I... No, this is actually... This one was not insidious at all. I genuinely was just like on a phone call with them. Um, and they just started asking me questions. And I, I am... I have had an inordinate amount of experience with death. Mm-hmm. 
and with people I know dying and seeing death and people I know almost dying. And I think that was attractive to them in some way. And I think that they saw that maybe I could have a personal journey within some of these episodes. And I think they were right, actually. I think that was true. I'm now asking you to speak for them a little bit. Um, And I am going to get into the details of your episodes, but do you know what in spot, like what made them want to do a show about people who are close to death? I don't know the answer to that. I, I think it was like, I honestly think at some point, I mean, almost all of these things come from some article that is optioned somewhere mm-hmm. where someone is like, Hey, uh, did you read this article about this person who does alternative burials? And from there sparked the idea. So I don't actually know the genesis of this, that, that would be my guess. Right. <clears throat> um, one of the executives actually is this woman, Greta Cohn, who you might not know, but who used to be in the band Cursive. Do you remember them, yes. Tony? Mm-hmm. And Did it? on the very first conference call I was on with all the executives, I was looking at her and I was like, I know this woman somehow. I somehow had met her. And I think it turned out I had interviewed her. And on that Zoom with like a bunch of heads, I was like, Greta, did you used to be in Cursive? And like a bunch of the execs on the call had no idea that she had ever been in this, like they were a pretty well-known band actually at one point. Um, and her and I kind of, I kind of like trusted her immediately just because of that background basically. Um, and I sort of trusted a lot of these producers that they would let me, I don't want to say have fun, but let me kind of toy with the medium a little bit. Didn't, and they did. And it, didn't you cursive say? have some sad story? Didn't I don't think so. Isn't that guy Tim Kasher, Tim Kasher from Cursive lives in Los Angeles, doesn't he? Yeah, I literally I, I literally watched a Dodger game with him last week. Did you really? Yeah. <laughs> Does he have um, irritable bowel syndrome or Crohn's? Like there's something <laughs> I know something about or someone in that band died. There's something here. I don't I, I don't know if I don't IBS know. qualifies as a tragic story. <laughs> I swear to God, there's something like they had to cancel a tour or something. Tony, someone in that band have a tonsillectomy at one point. I remember there was some sort of dark cloud hanging over their head. (laughs) All right, fine. Tony, get a Google and Greg. All right. So so tell us your uh, finding a dead body story. Yeah. So um, when I was 12, I can't can't, now. Now I can't remember if I was 12 or 13. I think I was 12. According to the episode I Um, listened to, you were 12. Yeah. A friend of mine came over in the morning, we used to go surfing before school and uh, he sort of knocked on my door and went down to the beach and we were sitting on the beach and sort of looked down the beach and there was like a person sleeping on the beach. What we thought was a, like a, it was a person. We thought it was like a, like a homeless person. Mm -hmm. And then we got closer and we realized like we were looking at a person in a wetsuit face down on the sand. Mm -hmm. And like we were kids. So we really like, didn't think that much about it. And we just sort of rolled him over. And it was a dead person. Jeez. It was a diver who had been out. Um, it was the first night of lobster season and the swell, surf was really big. It was big enough where nobody should have been out that night. And I think there were five of them and three of them made it out to sea and got rescued. One of them made it to the beach and this guy did not. So we like ran up to my home to my parents' house. And I was like, we just found a dead person. And uh, it was it's interesting. It's a really interesting story because I didn't talk about it for like 25 years or something. I'm not even sure my wife knew Mm. and I didn't talk about it. There was no reason I didn't talk about it other than just like, I think I had never really processed it. Mm -hmm. Um, And then when we started making this thing, I called my mom and I was like, will you tell me the story of that day? And she was like, kind of did a, Oh, I, I thought we would have this conversation at one point. Oh, wow. In your life. And she talked me through the whole day. And then I started to remember like, oh, she put me in therapy afterwards. Mm. And she like had me process it. We got interviewed by the paper. I remembered all that. And then I started Googling it and I like found out who the guy was. Who was he? Um, He was just some diver. I think he was from like Tustin or somewhere, but he was young. He was might have been like 22 or something. Oh, um, But then I remembered that I was sitting in our front in like our window that faced the street. And I watched them lift the sheet off of his face. Mm. And I watched his parents identify him. Oh my God. And um, I watched his mom like scream. Mm. And, it, and I remembered that my mother had like grabbed my arm and like pulled me away from the window. Mm-hmm. And she sort of talked me through this whole thing about how it was important for her to protect me from the trauma of all this. 
And when you're a kid, like you're just like, oh, cool. The like the news people are here and I'm at the center of the story. Um, and I didn't really sit down. This is like one example where this is real. This is like a real podcast thing. I really didn't actually process it until I made this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't think about how it impacted me. And then I realized like it actually desensitized me to death in a certain way that I think a lot of people weren't. And then two years after that, one of my best friends was drowned, was killed in a boating accident with his brother. You were 14. And then he was 14. Yeah. I was yeah 13 or 14. Yeah. 14. And then two years after that, another guy I was close friends with in high school died. So by the time I was 16, like I knew three people who were dead. I didn't know. I had seen one body and I knew two people who were dead. So I had a lot of close experience with death when I was really young. Did you experience a lot of grief? Uh, I did. Yeah, I think I did. I think I did. But I think at the same time, like I started to understand mortality in a different way. Mm -hmm. Um, And it seemed, it did not seem foreign to me. And I think for a, a lot of people, maybe, they're not that close to death until they're older, maybe until one of their parents dies or a sibling dies or something. By the time like my grandparents started to die, I was like pretty comfortable with death. You say, which is weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's not actually, it was just kind of a bummer actually. Um, but that's just kind of what happened to me. Did having experienced so much loss when more, when you experienced more recent, like, you know, I know your father passed away. Um, it's still going on now. Like my dad died five years ago. He was real sick. Um, I haven't talked about this that much, but during COVID, my younger sister came very close to dying. She basically like the first four months of my son's life was just us sitting at home waiting for the phone to ring for someone to tell me that my kid's sister was dead. Jesus. She's okay, Um, though. She is better. And then my older sister currently has cancer, Mm. has stage four cancer. So I'm like kind of flanked on all sides by death. Um, And in some ways, I'm like grateful that I've had a lot of preparation for it. Um, But in some ways, it's a bummer to it's a bummer of a thing to be desensitized to. Well, That's what I was going to ask. Do you feel like you're good at going through this? Do you think there is a such, such a thing? Yeah, I do. I do think I'm good at going through it. Um, about four years ago, another, uh, I, I also, in the last five years, I've lost three pretty good friends, two really close friends, actually. And I think I'm better at a lot of people than not delaying grief at not delaying grief. Mm-hmm. I think I'm, my understanding of the finality of things hits sooner. Yeah. I think I'm not saying that's not, that's certainly not a brag. Um, But if I were to say I have any sort of, I've gleaned anything from all that. It's that I don't like, it doesn't usually hit me six months later. I start processing it pretty quickly because the finality of it is not lost on me. Um, I know because it used to come up as like a running joke. Um, Mm -hmm. That it's not really a joke. It's serious. You have uh, recurring dreams about lobsters. That's correct. I do. And is that related to this dead body, given that it was the start of lobster season? Shit. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It might be. You know, that's not a thing that actually came up in therapy. Interesting. Jeez, Allison. I think I just solved you. I should pay you several thousand dollars. (laughs) Um, Lobsters... I used to dive for lobsters a lot when I was a kid and lobsters have a weird, they they're really symbolic of like wealth Mm -hmm. where we live. And so we sort of, and when we were kids, none of my friends wanted to process the lobsters. That's the term for like rip them in half and (laughs) cook them or whatever It's called processing. Does that mean I was all killing them and like getting them ready or just the preparing after they've been killed? It means a process of lobster is like to kill it and get ready okay. to eat it basically. Um, and I never had any problem doing it. And we, when we sort of got into it in psychotherapy, it actually like came down to symbolize this sort of 
rift in my brain between the desire to be successful and the desire to not be successful. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what lobsters symbolized for me. But I do, the beginning of lobster season has always, always like been a really important time in my life. I know that sounds strange, but when you grew up here, especially when you grew up on the beach, it sort of symbolizes like the end of summer and the beginning of the time the waves get really good. And it's like a really like important time in your life here, actually. So I think some of that factored into it as well. Although that's not something I've considered as much as the other parts of it, mm-hmm. but I think you're probably right. So well done. I owe you two hundred and fifty dollars. Only two fifty? I mean, yeah. just <laughs> two fifty. I'll give you a super bill. Um, okay. So uh, you are on the first episode, mm. and what's going to be the last episode, right? Yes, I am the bookends. Yeah. And- <clears throat> so in the first one. I write my own obituary. And you talk to a famous, I guess, obituary obit- writer, ra- writer yeah. who just goes by one name, Pope. Pope, yes. And uh, that was a really interesting experience. We were v- extremely different people. Wait, I'm reading the, this is the blurb of it. After finding a lock- lackluster obituary for his own dead father, writer and producer Greg Heller sets out to discover what actually makes an obit feel like a satisfying account of a person's life. That's true, actually. Um I did find my father's obituary to be lackluster. Who wrote so it? This is, and this is a really, I'm, I don't know who, I think probably his wife wrote it. Okay. The woman he married later in his life, but I really don't know actually. Um, this is a really interesting experience and is a really interesting way to like learn more about yourself because mm-hmm. you realize <clears throat> what you are and aren't willing to sort of brag about because obituaries are like kind of braggy in some way. Right. And you realize like there's some things you might think about yourself that you're not comfortable saying out loud. It's also really interesting because this guy Pope, who's sort of like a very classic Nolins kind of guy, mm-hmm. like wears a suit and like a bow tie or whatever. We did not speak the same language. I would say, I would say he found me to be informal and like slackery <laughs> in a certain way that he did not find journalistic and he was not amused with like the way I wrote. And so there's actually some sort of interesting culture clash in it. I found him to be like a really nice, really fascinating guy, but I'm not so sure who'd want to work with me again. And at one point he actually like called the producers and kind of asked to bail out of the podcast. Yeah. Because he was not, he did not feel like I was servicing what he was asked to do. What does that mean? He didn't feel like you were taking it seriously enough. He felt like I was disrespectful of the process. Yeah. I have to say, Um, and obviously I'm a Greg Heller fan, but <laughs> it was a very funny, interesting, ep- both of your episodes, I really enjoyed them. I thought that you took, or that I don't know whether to give you or them or all of you guys credit, but like you're talking about something really, ser- you know, potentially a somber and you made it very listenable and funny. So he can Well, I've just- been aiming for listenable. I have to say like at the beginning of this thing, when we sat out some objective- <laughs> listenable was on my was on my wall and i was like if only it could be listenable right um you know what well, I f- you did it I, I i did feel like and i do feel like there's a way when talking about anything and when talking about death to be i don't think being funny means you're being irreverent of death no. i think you can be both of those things at the same time to be um, entertaining I think-, I think you need to have that levity and i think you brought levity so he can uh he can eat his hat well, it wasn't, he didn't push me away from levity. I think he just felt that I was a little not non-journalistic. And I think he felt I was a heavy-handed writer. And I am like a heavy-handed writer, sort of intentionally. Mm-hmm. Of a heavy-handed um, writer of your own obit or of yeah, the... Yeah, of, of my own obit. But I like kind of... But you weren't... Uh, hello, you of, didn't really die. <laughs> That's not I didn't real. really die. But I've always sort of thumbed my nose at like the idea of like journalistic rules yeah and i think pope who does who writes obits for a living felt like there was a certain like tone and timbre you had to take when writing an obituary and i did not feel that way and i also felt like you could sort of vacillate between being reverent and being like beavisy i'm trying and to, i just don't think he felt that I'm way i'm trying to get a sense of this guy but first i have to find out tony did you find out does this guy have irritable bowel syndrome <laughs> or crohn's <laughs> 
The closest thing that I could find <laughs> is that in two, it says they toured extensively throughout 2001 to 2002 to the point of exhaustion, and Casher suffered a collapsed lung, and they had to cancel the rest of the tour. Yes, I was not very close, but I knew something <laughs> oh. had happened. Did you get a tragedy strikes, <laughs> Tony? When you were at the baseball game with him, did you get a collapsed lung vibe? I didn't pick up on that. <laughs> no. Did it seem like he has regular solid BMs? Oh, yeah. oh I saw them. So, yeah, they did. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Yeah, you guys went to a game together. You watched him shit. That's how it works. <laughs> so, um, um, I'm trying to get a sense of this Pope guy. Did, like, who would play him in a movie? Oh, hold on. Let me just think about this for one second. Okay. Who is, like, sort of a wizened like 70 year old man but who could also be kind of hip ed harris ed harris is not bad ed ed harris could do it actually ed harris is not bad ed harris is not bad i'm gonna say ed harris okay interesting because you said new or new orleans i was picturing like a paul prudhomme dom de kind of figure no he's not that big <laughs> He's like a skinny dude. Do you want to see a picture of yes. him? Yes. Um, I think Ed Harris might be too young, although Ed Harris is probably now older than I imagine that he is. Mm -hmm. um, Ed Harris has kind of vanished, right? He's on Westworld. Oh. I, I don't actually, he was on Westworld. I don't think he still is. Uh, I can't remember. Look, did you ever see Poltergeist 2? No. I, remember the Let Me In guy from Poltergeist 2? And I also didn't see Poltergeist Tony? 1. Uh, it's been too long. I don't even yeah, remember for sure if I saw it. Oh, interesting. I'm also but, getting but, a little bit of a Sam Waterston vibe. Perhaps. And you know how bow tie is sort of like a personality? Yes. Yeah. He had very bow tie personality. I don't, I, again, like, I, I think he's, he's an extremely gifted guy. I think he's a, like a wonderful dude. He just, I would not say our styles were commensurate <laughs> got it we had uh, we definitely had a bit of a culture clash and he did really call my producer at one point and was like yeah i don't, sure. I don't think i want to work with this dude anymore and then, regarding me but then what happened then they talked him into staying and i did a second session with him where i read my revised obituary where they they sent him my revised obituary and he was like it's better and then he said something about how like they're gonna have to publish it in rolling stone because of all the obscure music references i made i like which by okay. the way were like none but to him, they were obscure. Um, they were like, not, I don't want anything to be in Rolling Stone. And and then that was sort of the end of it. Um, and But I really liked my time with him. You famously, to people who know you, famously, very briefly, dated a celebrity. That is correct. And you had never revealed the name before. That is correct. I mean, you had told me. So I imagine you, you tell your friends who it was. But you hadn't publicly revealed it. And so a big, you are debating whether to reveal it in your obituary, which is so funny because yeah. it really does not pertain to your life. It does not. And, you know, he really pushed me to, like, tell certain stories from my life. Like I told the story about um, getting arrested on Mother's Day oh, and going to jail on Mother's Day. And your Day mom and not bailing you out. And my mom not <laughs> bailing me out. And, uh, and I told him that story and he was like, well, I think at one point when I was talking to him, he was like, well, have you ever been in jail? And I was like, I have. Yeah. And he was like, well, you have to tell that story. And again, like, that's a really small part of my life. Mm -hmm. It actually says much more about my mom than it does about me. Um, and I think ultimately I took it out, to tell you the truth. And the part about the celebrity, I, in the final version, I, I also took it. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. Um, but if you listen to this episode, you can find out who it is. Um, and it's Nell Carter. <laughs> Wait a minute. So you're, so you're saying... They, the listeners, I'm confused. The listeners are not going to find out that it was. They are going to find out. Oh. In in that episode, you do find out. I just, it doesn't make the final cut of the obituary, right. but it is discussed. Yes, exactly. Um, and I have actually, I didn't talk about that for a long time, but I have like, I, I don't know what the, what the right way to approach it is, but like, I now feel like I can discuss it and not feel like I'm bragging. Can we say who it is? I, uh, no, but we should tease. We should make people listen to the fucking okay, episode. Listen to the fucking episode. Yeah, that's the point. But I, I think we all have things like that where, like, we did something interesting and we, like, sometimes in the course of conversation, it should come up, but you're hesitant to talk about it because it sounds like you're being a, a jerk. Yes. 
And that's how I felt about that for many years. Um, and now I think I'm a little bit more tongue in cheek about it. Craig, do you know what you should do with all these conflicting feelings? You should. I should buy my undies or whatever. No, you should probably talk to a therapist. <laughs> okay, I mean, okay. granted, I don't. I live with one. Yeah. Well, you should. I mean, your wife, that'd be a terrible choice for a therapist. And I think she would have to recuse herself. I yes. think that earlier in the episode, I did solve all your problems by making a pretty obvious link that your therapist had missed before. But you're, you're, no one's going to miss anything with better help. These are great therapists. Look. Mm. Going to therapy is like a lot of things we already do. We get our cars tuned up to prevent bigger issues down the road. We get annual checkups. We go to the gym. We go to the doctor. We do chores regularly to avoid messes. Going to therapy is like all the above. It's routine maintenance for your mental and emotional wellness to prevent bigger issues down the road. Therapy doesn't mean something's wrong with you. Although something could be wrong with you, not you personally, no offense, but you get what I'm saying. It just means you're investing in yourself to keep your mind healthy. You guys know that I'm a huge fan of therapy. Um, it's helped me immensely. I, uh, it has? It has. Well, I'm look, kidding. there's still room I to... I know it has. You got better. I mean, there's still... You don't, you don't even know what I was like years ago. I mean, I get. I appreciate that you're saying there's still stuff to work on. <laughs> And a fun little joke between Daniel and me is I'll be like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to therapy. And he'll be like, want me to make, this is kind of related to what we were talking about earlier, hacky jokes that you have to make. It's like, want me to give you a list of what you should work on? Mm. We have fun. Anyway, look, <laughs> BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy. And you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. I have two friends who are doing better help right now, and it is helping them so much. Why invest in everything else and not your mind? This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Allison Rosen listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash best friend. That's betterhelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P.com slash best friend. I also want to talk to you guys about Ring, specifically the Ring Alarm. Um, I love the Ring Alarm. When we first moved into this house, we wanted to get an alarm system. And I looked into some of the other ones that I had heard of. And there were just things that I, I didn't like about each of them. Specifically, that you can't set it up yourself. You have to you wait for someone to come out. It's a whole, it is a whole thing. If you guys look into alarms, you'll see many of the ones out there. They're a whole thing. The Ring Alarm is super easy. You get it. You set it up yourself whether you're handy or not. Um, it works seamlessly with your other Ring devices. If you happen to have other Ring devices, we already had a Ring doorbell. That was my introduction to Ring. And I can't imagine life without the Ring doorbell. Um, and the Ring alarm is just as indispensable. That being said, you don't have to have the other products. I'm just saying you may find that you, the, the Ring system, it's pretty amazing. So anyway, Daniel got it. We set it up and then we went on vacation. Again, this was a couple of years ago. And it just brought such peace of mind to know that we could monitor our home from far away. Protect your home anytime from anywhere with Ring Alarm. Go to ring.com slash best friend for a special offer on a Ring Alarm security kit today. You can build the system that's right for your home and have it up and running in minutes. That's ring.com slash best friend. That's ring.com slash best friend. I am realizing. So we're getting oodles of Greg right now. Uh. But this is not this is not going to be the end of this because you're also going to you're also coming on a Thursday show. Uh, now, I am? did you say it? What is that? <laughs> We're recording that? that on November 1st. Did I know that? Yes. Or is this just like a twofer? You get one, you get the other. No, you knew did you, this. Did you already talk about this? Yeah. We, yes, we did. Do you have a conflict? I don't know, but that's <laughs> fine. No, I mean, not, not that that's fine. I mean, I want to do it. It's more than fine. Who's going to be the other person on it? Is it going to be Jordan? It's Jenna Allen, Jeff. Oh, did I know that? I don't think I told you that. <laughs> Surprise. Oh, okay. What time is it? 5.30 p.m. on Monday. Okay. Cool. <laughs> We've had, go, if you go back in your text, we had this conversation. Okay. But, but will you remind me? But for real, do you have a conflict? Not that I see on my calendar, no, but I'm having some problems with my calendar. It's not syncing right. And you ever have that thing where like some of your old calendar events pop up and you can't delete one entire calendar? I don't know if I've ever even tried. In general, you I don't. You know what I'm talking about, Tony? Like you'll have a calendar that's like from an old show or like an old touring thing or whatever. And you want to delete it, but the calendar never totally vanishes. I think so. Are you talking Google calendar specifically? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I had that issue. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I really don't know, but I don't see a conflict here and I'll set that time aside. What I, I rem have found. I'm glad I agreed to do that. I'm, I'm <laughs> glad that it's been top of mind for you. What I have found is that people, people will invite you to their whatever 
you agree to it on email and then you just get a calendar invitation with all the info. And then I go to my laptop computer where I don't have the calendar sync and I can't get the Zoom info. So I say normalize emailing that link to people. Yeah, I agree. And if you had this one bullshit one where it seems like it's a Google Hangout, but then in the Google Hangout, there's a Zoom link that you're supposed to use. Have you heard that bullshit one? No, I haven't. Yeah, I don't know. Seems like it should be easier. And there's sometimes where I fault myself for being old or whatever, but then there's sometimes where I'm like, no, this is their fault. Try this one on for size. I agreed agreed to have a call with someone. What does have a call mean? Tony, do you have the Jeopardy music or whatever? (laughs) What does have a call mean to you? What does have a call? What does have a call mean? Are you asking both of us? Um, I guess well, I am. I'm ruminating, like you know, on game shows. Yeah. Like, what does what does, what does okay. Oh, what does? We're happen? hop on a call. Sorry, hop on a call. <laughs> hop on a. Oh, now it's hop. We're gonna hop on a call. Do I have jump time to hop on a call? Meet, jump into a meeting. Hop on a call. Jump into a meeting. Jump into a call. Jump into. Okay. Okay. Greg Heller. Uh, I, I think it means. Uh, have a phone call with someone. Okay. Tony Thaxton? Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> that is what I thought. So then imagine my surprise when I got the calendar invite and it was a Zoom link. Oh, uh, it must have been mortifying for you as one who values your appearance on Zoom. Well, thankfully, it has not happened yet. So I can make myself look non-atrocious. But I just... You know what your background looks like? By the way, do I know it? It looks, looks like, like, you know, you know how like almost every wedding is in a barn now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then you go to the wedding and it's in a barn and you have to hear that Ray Le Montaigne song or whatever. I don't think I know it, but it's um you are you are the best thing, greatest. You know the song, Tony? No. It plays at every wedding in a barn with strings of bulb lights <laughs> or whatever. And mason you jars. You are the like 90% of white people who get married in barns play this Ray Le Montaigne song. You never, this is like, it's the wedding song. I'm sure we Anyway, that's your background looks like you're at like a white people barn wedding. I know. And the funny thing is, this is a backdrop. I actually don't have this shiplap or whatever it's called. I I don't love this backdrop. I got to change it. Okay. I got to change it. You are, it's Ray Le Montaigne. I know that name. (laughs) He's like one of those beard troubadour guys who somehow sells out like the Hollywood bowl or whatever. Because people are like, what's at the bowl tonight? It's Ray Le Montaigne. Let's go have some white wine and listen to that wedding. Yeah. And then you're on Instagram and you're like, everyone. I didn't know so many of my friends were into Ray Le Montaigne. Yeah. I didn't know so many of my friends were into Alanis. I mean, I'm I'm into it. I just didn't know they all were going to go to the bowl to see her. You ought to know. Ray Le Montaigne. Oh, really? I I don't get anything for you ought to know. Come on. What? Oh, oh, God, I missed it. That's so ironic. Um, uh, so I believe what I was saying before I discovered that Greg doesn't make note of plans and whatnot. You're coming yeah. on the Thursday show. So mm-hmm. now when this airs, it's not going to actually be the same week as that. But we have prepared some audio features Wait, as if the same week, <laughs> even though it's not Wait, the same of what week. audio features of what? And also, we I think we pulled some Greg Heller drops and I'm realizing Wait, Tony audio- hasn't had a chance to play them because you've just been talking about death. Yeah, it didn't really seem like a <laughs> drop friendly. Before talk. we move on, let me just say I'm in a second episode where I have my own funeral. OK, now we can keep going. No, I, I, I intend we're taking a break. And then That's we're going to talk. I don't mind. I know, I want I know to, death is like, it's not the most fun. Thing I want to talk about. No, I want to talk about that one, too. But I just want everyone to know. Montaigne. I mean, imagine it's all the same week. Play something, Tony. Isn't that I mean, fun? Look how excited. <laughs> Wait, was that it? <laughs> that sounded like the tease to it, but that was That's it. it. Well, we got a few okay. of them. Just things to okay. sprinkle in. To indicate how special it is. Let's hear another one, Tony. It's a Hellenado. <laughs> oh, wait. Is there something else? We're having one Hellenado. <laughs> <laughs> That's embarrassing for you. 
Uh, real quick, if I may if, chime in real quick. While you were reading the ads, I took a better look at this uh, John Pope guy. I'd like to pitch Michael Caine to play him. Oh. oh. You know, I think I believe Michael Caine just retired. I think you're right. Can we get yeah, him out of retirement? I think so. To play to play New Orleans obituary writer John Pope? <laughs> yeah. Maybe. I mean, he, he I mean Michael Caine has to be north of 90, right? Yes. Probably. I mean, Clute is what? Is in like the mid 30s or whatever. Michael Caine age. Yeah, dude is 88. Oh, he's 88. He's 88. He he could play Pope. And he, at the end, you know what he'll do? The Pope movie will be he'll be at the end of his life, and he'll be telling the story of his life, and they'll use that as the device to begin the flashbacks and all that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Where it's sort of be he'll be mm-hmm. like, I remember it was 1904, and then like like hear- old timey music yeah. will play and they'll dissolve, and he'll be like a little kid eating potatoes or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm just, I don't know if he's Irish. Uh, okay, good That's pitch. Totally Tony. bananas, I would say. <laughs> so, in the second episode, which bookends this, how many episodes are there in all? Six. Um, you're gonna crush me with a six episode arc. Give me a break. Well, I think I mean I can't speak. I haven't heard the other four, but I do think the two that I made could probably crush like six months of your content. Is my guess. It's <laughs> so- probably a two. Two episode to six month would be the, a, the correct ratio. Hmm. So in the second one you do, it's called Funerals, and you meet with a death doula, which is very interesting. Correct. Uh, the, oh, yeah. And you have a, a, a funeral for yourself. Yeah. This is a woman named Jill Shock, who when you're mortally, mortally, not mortally wounded, who when you're terminally ill, you call her. And you say like, hey, I want to start planning the end of my life. And she not only takes care of all the logistics, but she sort of designs a, some sort of a party or a funeral that you can attend like like before you funeral. die. Um, and this was like a really wonderful conversation. And if you, kind of regardless of how you feel about death I, and me, regardless of how you feel about me, this is an interesting one to listen to because Jill has a perspective on death that very, very, very few people have. And I was like, every conversation I had with her was fascinating. And she, you go away from that episode, or at least from the conversation with her thinking like, this is the way to die. Mm-hmm. If you're in control of your own death, if it's not like a hit by a bus situation or a collapsed lung on tour with cursive type thing, you want to do this kind of thing that celebrates the end of your life. You know, it's interesting and, because she talked about part of what she does is like, she'll be where she'll be there with the person when they're dying. And my first reaction was like, but wouldn't you want, a loved one, not her to be right next to you when you're dying. But then the more I listened, the more I was like, Oh, I could see where she would be a really comforting presence because your loved one is freaked out probably. And sad. She she has, Jill has like a very rare, extremely grounded disposition. I'm trying to think of, I think one of the things you take away from her, and this is a good, just takeaway in general is like, she just, Jill just doesn't bullshit about dying. Mm -hmm. Um, and she doesn't bullshit about the process of it. And the way she talks about it is sometimes like unnervingly matter of fact, the way she talks about like the decomposition of a body and what happens after you've been on ice in your living room for three days. But there's something comforting about people who are matter of fact, Yes, especially but it's, it's a, in general, people are comforted when you don't bullshit. Mm-hmm. But I think with death, people expect a certain amount of platitude and a certain amount of bullshit. And euphemism. And Jill just doesn't have it. And it makes death like a, an approachable thing. And I, she's like, she's a very unusual person. And I think a lot of people, even if they never have that kind of death or they've never even thought about it, it's worth listening to just to consider a different way to die. Did And in, in that episode, I, I fake my own death. From I dry have. skin. From eczema, yes. And we have at my friend David Alexis's house, we like buried me in their backyard. And the whole thing is bullshit. But at the very end, when I'm like laying there wrapped in my burial shroud and Jill is talking and I'm listening to my friends talk, like it felt really, it actually felt real. Mm -hmm. And I felt like safe. It was a really interesting experience that like made me think a lot about how I want to die. How do you want to die? Not like the, 
Well, I don't mean like what ailment I want to die from. No, because you were ripped know. apart by wolves in your obit. Torn uh, in, in my obit, I'm torn apart by wolves, which I think is an interesting way to die because I like like a kind of a splatter core death metal type of death. Mm-hmm. I like that idea. Well, what I think is funny is I think it's funny to die in a way that you cannot discuss it, a, that you can't like downplay. Right. To me, that's funny. But then when like it came were, when it came to your real fake death, you chose eczema. Yeah, because I also think it's funny to have such bad dry skin. You <laughs> die of dry skin. And I also have like, I am a long-term sufferer of eczema. Yeah. And I thought maybe some Jews could relate to it. <laughs> but I like the wolves idea because like, there's so many ways you can die where people are like, oh, his, he had like a heart attack or whatever. Or if you get decapitated, someone could say like, oh, he was murdered or whatever. But if you're torn apart by wolves, like there's no, it's very difficult to make that one like less gory. Right. It's true. Yeah. Can I share one of my favorite lines of yours? I don't want to like spoil anything. Please. No, I think please, it's okay. Me. So uh, it turns out that to hire Jill, you have to be able to prove that you're really dying. Like some pe- apparently some people think that they're dying. I feel like she was suggesting they're hypochondriacs, but she didn't say it. Like some people will think they're dying and they'll call her, but like they aren't. So, so you're like a note on dying, get a note. You're dying. (laughs) (laughs) Well, actually that happens. Like it's happened to her a handful of times Yeah, where people are so infatuated with dying that they hire her to shepherd them into death. And they're not actually about to die. So interesting. That's the thing. Like people do really fetish. Some people do really fetishize dying and it's not even. Are they goth? That. I don't know if they're goth, actually. I don't. I didn't ask that specific question. She did tell me that she occasionally listens to Cannibal Corpse, oh, yeah. which I found to be really cool. <laughs> um, I asked her that question as a troll, but she was like, "Actually, I do sometimes. I really do." You, know, you should listen to this episode, even if you don't like any of the other ones, or whatever, because she's just a really interesting person. Did much you more so than- find her? Like, was this your idea? Did had they already contacted her? And same with Pope. Pope, they found. Um, and they originally had a different death doula woman. But like I, when I first started to like research her, I was like, this woman is not going to have a sense of humor about this. She was very like ethereal and Muslim or whatever. Yeah, and looked she sounds gauzy. Like Stevie Nixie or whatever, really gauzy. And she also sort of talked like a yoga teacher. And I just felt like she wasn't going to play along. Mm-hmm. And Jill, I felt like not only was she going to play along, it turns out there were a bunch of things. Jill was like, I know you think you're being funny, but fuck you. I'm going to say something real in return. And she was like, she's a really amazing, unusual person. Just marry her, Greg. She kind of is a celeb crush to tell you the truth. We're both taking my wife. (laughs) Yes. But if I ever get close to dying, Soon. Hi, everything okay with you? I'm close to dying. Call Jill. Is your lung collapsed? Hang on one second. I got to cough this out. (laughs) Okay, I'm back. (laughs) Um, I would consider using her as someone like her. I didn't, I don't even think I knew that death doulas existed. Yeah, I'm not sure that I did either, actually. And we had some pretty real talks like off mic about my sister and all that. And like what would happen if my sister got like really, really, really sick and we would want to use this kind of system or whatever, this kind of service. Hmm. Yeah, hmm. it's very sad. So that's episode six, and that drops on December first. Um, <laughs> I'll be crushed by then. I'll just be like a. I'll just be under yeah, the first one. My first episode comes out on the twenty seventh, so you'll be partially crushed. And it's called and Cl- then, who's the who's the host of it? This guy Utkarsh Ambukdar. Who is Ambudkar. he? Budkar. Um, he's an actor. Um, and the sort of a comic actor. Uh, I know. I knew him because. He was in a movie that was directed by a guy. Sorry, um, that I. What's going on? Are you responding? Are you answering some emails? Is your work blowing up? I, I'm look. Sorry, the Dodgers are playing the Braves right now. Um, but he was in a movie called Blind Spotting that was directed by a guy Carlos, who I developed another show with, and that's how I first came to know who Karsh was. Got it. And he also has sort of like a lifelong relationship and a quest to understand death, and I think they thought he was going to be the right host for this, and he was. In Good fairness deal. to you. I think you told us we had to record early because of something involving the Dodgers. That's correct. But I thought this was going to be a 5 p.m. game, not a two o'clock game. Oh, no, man. We're getting fucked. You guys, it's it's fine. 
Well, um, look, I forgot that we have a lot of questions that were sent in. I was thinking we have your, hey, go fuck yourselves, and then we're out, and Tony can play some drops. But it turns out we have, I can't believe I forgot this. I'm, I'm off my game. Um, we have like a, an array of questions sent in by lovely people, and we need to answer them. So as I said before, I'm on Patreon. Patreon. Thank you. Patreon.com slash Allison Rosen. Um, bonus episodes of the friend zone. There's a level where you can text me and I'll text you back. The texting people love that. And I love it too. Uh, you can submit questions. You can submit carbohydrates. You can watch videos of the Thursday show and unfettered access to me. And if you sign up for an annual subscription, you get 12 months for the price of 10. So you get two months free and you have to turn the air conditioning off when you record your podcast or the fan. And it gets really hot. Does that happen to you? No, I just keep it real low. And it seems like, okay. can you hear the fan in this room, Tony? No, not through zoom. We may we, it, on your track. On your, we will uh, track. Yeah. Mm, Cause it's hot in here. Sorry, Allison, you were saying about Patreon. Just sign up. Won't you? Okay. And we have some questions. Okay. Questions from our fans. All right. Becky Milner wants to know any chance there will be a sibling for Ellis. Uh, I've been asked that like three or 400 times probably in the last six months. Uh, by your wife? Sure. No, by a, a lot. Who asked that question? Becky Milner. How do you feel in general about like, let's ask Tony as a third party here. Tony, do, how do you feel? And I say this with all respect to Becky. I'm asking this question objectively, objectively. Tony, how do you feel about asking people if they're going to have children? Mm. I think it might depend on the person, but overall, I don't like if it's just like a casual like conversation, like you guys going to have you guys thinking about having kids or something like I don't think that's that bad of a thing to do. Allison, how do, how do you feel? How do you feel about it? I get the sense that you're not loving it. Well, I actually don't care. And I, I don't know if we'll have a sibling for him or not. Um, I do not know. I'm so I'm having so much fun with him right now. I can't even like imagine focusing on another kid. Um. But there's sometimes I've asked people if they're going to have kids and they get really pissy. Mm-hmm. And that might just be like an L.A. like Gen Z thing or whatever. Right. I definitely have an inordinate number of fucking I was going to say lobotomized. What's it called when you have your nuts cut in half or whatever? Vasectomy. Vasectomy friends or whatever. Uh, who I think when you say are you going to have kids? They go, no, we're not going to have kids. That um, ship has sailed. I, I got snipped. But- I've heard that exact thing from people. I don't know if we'll have another kid, actually. I don't like... Do you have siblings, Tony? Mm-hmm. Two older sisters, yeah. I don't... There's no part of me that thinks he's going to be miserable if he doesn't have a sibling. Sometimes one of my sisters will say, like, well, don't you ha- want him to have a buddy? Um, and the answer is I, like, don't know. I'm also, like, an old dad, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and I'm looking down the road, and I'm like, shit. You know, when he's 25 or whatever, I'm going to be 70 something i'm 16 i don't know how old i'm gonna be i'm gonna be old that's an argument uh, for a sibling i think yeah and uh you you think that's an argument for a sibling well i know that daniel felt that it was an argument for a sibling because this idea that like we want you know we're not going to be around forever and we want him to still have buddies or family or something like that yeah i don't i the the honest answer is like i don't know this has been i mean i i lost like we lost a tremendous amount of like work yeah you know a lot of the the work that i do in particularly was really like decimated by covid so i wouldn't say we're in like the world's greatest financial security position or whatever so the i'm just like looking going like day by day with Mm -hmm. him and if at some point someone ends up impregnated maybe like another child will pop out or whatever but i like we really i haven't sat down and planned it is the answer and neither has she i don't think yeah um not with me anyway you know, I think having an only kid is perfect. And I think having siblings is perfect. I think it's all perfect for, for us. I just always had two. That was like what I, in my head, what I wanted. Um, and I was, you know, I felt like we were unbelievably lucky that we got Elliot. And so I didn't think that we could be so lucky as to also have another kid. And then, and then, you know, we were. And for me, 
when Owen was like all of a sudden when Owen was home, it was like, oh, the family feels complete in a way that it didn't before. But I think what gives you that feeling of like the family feels complete, it's kind of different for everyone. Yeah. My family feels complete right now. Yeah. Also feel complete with another sibling, but like almost every single day I wake up and I cannot believe how lucky I am and how much fun I'm. I just spent the weekend alone with him for three days and it was like, the, there were so many things I was going to do. I was going to take him places and show him to all these people. At the end of the day, I was just like, I just want to hang out with him all day. Yeah. And, uh, and it's a bummer not going surfing or whatever. You can't get, you can't, you can't, you can't drink as much. But other than that, it was like three of the greatest days ever. Aside from those things. Jill Poo three says, how many Greg's do you know? <laughs> uh, like four or something. Is it a weird name? <laughs> No, it's a common, it's a common name. It's a common name, yeah. How do you feel, Tony, about asking other people if they know a Greg? <laughs> it's a weird question. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't know what the right. What's the right number? I don't know. Well, Allison, how many Gregs? I, I guess I know a couple of other. Well, Gregs. well I, I know. I know. I, I would say there's two main Gregs. There's Greg Fitzsimmons, and there's you. Like if someone says Greg, and I don't know which one it is, it's either Fitzsimmons or Heller. So I, I would say I, my Greg. Number is two. Did you uh, did you vet these questions? Did you give these a pre-read? Of course not. Okay. <laughs> Phyllis Hauser would like to know, what's the most surprising thing about being a dad? I don't know anybody named Phyllis. I'll tell you that much. I, we, I our know, Phyllis number is one. It's yeah. interesting, though, <laughs> that my Greg number is two and my Phyllis number is one when Phyllis is somewhat of an unusual name and Greg is like a very common name. Um, the most unusual thing about being a dad what was it yeah that's the question what's the most unusual thing about being a dad i I hate i'm like hesitant to say this like i don't think it's that hard that's been the thing that's most surprising to me i uh it's really similar to television (laughs) showrunner i swear to god it's almost identical like how like when you are show running you're driving to work in the morning or you're driving to set and in your head you are going, I need to see the revised script pages. I have to respond to the graphics people with my notes on the graphics they sent over yesterday. I have a call with the executive. So I need to make sure I have my notes ready for one Oh three. We have to sit down and do a table read at noon. So lunch has to be in at 11 o'clock. I need to talk to the PA about his behavior on set yesterday. I need to sit down and I need to make sure the script, like that's what you're doing and you do, that's what's happening in your head and you don't, finish working until every single one of those things is checked off in your brain. Mm -hmm. That's what show running is. And that's what having a baby is. And I wake up in the morning and I'm like, okay, the oatmeal has to be started in 15 minutes. I have to have my cup of coffee done in five minutes. If I want to go surfing, Ellis has to eat breakfast by nine o'clock. The nanny gets here at nine 15. So his lunch has to be ready by then he goes down for his nap at one. I'm taking it back. Like that's what I'm doing. And none of it seems that hard the only things that have been hard for me have been emotional. Like how? It's one thing I will say, traveling on the, the plane fucking sucks. That's hard. Yeah. Traveling is hard. There was one moment when we took him back to see Ayala's folks that I broke down in the parking lot of the rental car place. And Ayala said, what are we going to do? And I literally said, like, I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do because the car seat we brought didn't fit in the car. Oh, jeez. And Ellis was super sick and we'd been traveling for 10 hours. And it was the first time I actually said, like, I don't know what we're going to do. But the, the one, I guess what has been surprising is what people are afraid of. I am not afraid of Ellis getting hurt. Interesting. I never think about him getting cut or falling down or choking or any of those things because I feel like I'm with him and I'm watching him and I was a kid and I know what's going to happen. I'm afraid of him being sad. Mm. And I'm afraid of him being lonely. So when we stare at the baby monitor at night, my wife is like, is he okay? Is he breathing? And I'm like, he looks lonely. He's sad. He looks so people constantly have to say to me like, dude, he's not sad. He's just playing by himself. Yeah. He's not lonely. He's just in the other room. So that's, I guess that's been my one realization is like, I'm really afraid of him being sad. And I have almost no fear of him like getting hurt. Are you and maybe that will change at some point, but that's been my that's been my big thing. So my wife is constantly saying to me, he's OK, he's just playing. And I'm constantly saying, like, pay attention to him. Go play with him. 
go pick him up, go walk with him. And she's like, he's just playing. He has to learn how to be by himself. So that's the thing I'm afraid of. Did you, so that's, there's some sort of self-discovery in that. Yeah. Did you do any sort of like sleep training or any of that? Yeah. And yeah, he sleeps incredibly. He lays down every night at like eight o'clock and he doesn't open his eyes until seven in the morning. But did, did, has he always done that? Or I guess what always. I'm asking is like, have you, if he's he, an incredible sleeper because I all was terrified he would be like me and I never go to bed. Right. He's an incredible sleeper. If he's that's another thing they don't tell you, by the way, the kid goes to bed and you can like fuck around until three in the morning. Like you can go in the other room and play guitar all night. Like they don't wake up. You, like, this this is not, this sleep. is not the case with all babies. Right. Okay. I have an easy baby. I know that. Um, but he has been sleep trained and it worked. But was that hard for you to think that he might like, cause that's typically where someone's like, they're sad. They're lonely. I have to go in. Was that hard for you? Yeah. But he sleep trained really easily. Okay. <laughs> like by the time Ellis was out of his snoo, I think he was out of his snoo when he was like nine months or something like that. He was like hitting the mattress and going to sleep every night yeah. and sleeping all night. Yeah, that He's was been very easy in that sense. That was the. Did you guys use a snoo? No, we didn't. But oh. if I, I'm not going to. But if I were to have another baby, I might because they're supposed to be like magical. They're pretty cool. Um, so that's been my that's been my big surprise is that I'm terrified of him being lonely and sad. Are you projecting? I, I'm not sure. Actually, I think it's something I'm going to have to work out. Because even though we talk about it all the time, I still like once a day, I'm like, he's sad, he's sad, he's sad, he's yeah. sad, he's sad. And I know like any, any psychologist or wife will say to you, like, he's supposed to be sad. That's part of the process of like having, like becoming a, emotionally mature. Right. But it's still really hard for me. Well, as your ther- new therapist, I would say, were you sad and lonely when you were a little kid? I don't think so. I don't know. I, you know, I don't think so. You look at pictures of me a lot when I was a kid and I do look kind of morose. Mm-hmm. Um, but I like, and there was like a pretty brutal divorce in my family when I was a kid. So maybe, maybe I was. Um, but there's also something for me about like, when you see your kid with a, like a couple of, like a month ago, he ran into a tree and he had blood coming mm-hmm. out of his nose. And I was like, oh, he's fine. He has a bloody nose. I've had like a hundred bloody noses. It seems like curable. And sadness to me is like less tangible. Right. Yeah. I, I think I feel the way about most people. If I saw Tony at a bar or something, he had a broken arm. I'd be like, his arm is going to be fine in six weeks. If I saw Tony at a bar somewhere and he looked sad, that would be sad. I don't want to see you at a bar sad. Tony. <laughs> if I like walked in and Tony was alone at the end of the bar, slouched over a cocktail or whatever, that would be sad. No one wants to see that. If you ever see your mm. baby alone at a bar, slouched over a cocktail. Yeah, that would be sad. Tony, we're going to need some, some of these Greg drops. Even if there's not. A- That's cool, bro. That's the way shit goes down. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear another. Most people think I'm a fat old guy from New York. Thank you. Oh, it's so Super true. That even came up on Jew the podcast. Jew or Mexican. Yeah. Su- Jew or Mexican? Oh, oh, I know what that is. That's different. <laughs> I think I was discussing my dating profile. Um, okay. Lisa Lowry says, I have an abundance of fenugreek recipe ideas. So a fenugreek, I think you want to go. Yeah. Um, Get a Four book. avocados. <laughs> <laughs> now, fenugreek pairs really well with um, like Eastern European and Southern Russian cuisine. So I'm going to recommend a book to this woman or an author, actually, whose name is Olia Hercules. What a cool name. Um, do you know who she is? No. And she has a book called Caucasus, K-A-U-K-S-I-S, which is like a journey through like Azerbaijan and the Ukraine and fenugreek is used like extensively in a bunch of the recipes. So rather than like go over, but I would just like read about like Ukrainian and Eastern European. A lot of those recipes call for fenugreek. It's a challenging ingredient to use because if you overuse it, it destroys whatever you're putting it in. What does it so taste you have to like? Have like a light kind of anise. Mm. Um, we don't eat it that often here because we don't really have a taste for it. And also we don't eat a lot of, this isn't a big root vegetable country in the same way other places are. Get an Olea Hercules book. She'll teach you how to use it. I love, She's also like I love a fennel vegetable. bulb. Is that a root mm. vegetable? Fennel is a root. Yeah. I love a, f- a shaved fennel bulb. Sure. An apple and a balsamic. Yeah, it's great. Um, Greg, do people still talk yeah. to you about avocados all the time? Or has it died down? Yes, they do. They do. 
They do. And I have a complicated relationship with them. I know. Because I want people to eat good avocados, but I also don't want to talk about them that much. I know that I'm drop. Sorry, just I wouldn't feel like having like, a conversation right now. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm like stopped on the street all the time about it, but it does come up on occasion. Yes. Angela D says, what do you look forward to teaching Ellis more fishing or surfing? Fishing hundred percent. The answer is very easy. Why fishing? I'm not even sure I want Ellis to surf. Well, fishing is more practical. Um, and I think it's more, it's definitely more, you can feel your freezers, freezer with it, but more than anything, I have real reservations about him being around surfers. Mm. Fish, a lot of fisher people are not like that awesome either, but you can fish in a vacuum much more than you can surf in a vacuum. And surf culture is like not, it's a pretty abhorrent thing. Does the ocean, is it like a magnet for drifters and shitheads? I wouldn't say drifters. There's not a lot, <laughs> but it's surfing is a culture does not value individuality and intellect. We went to this Mackey joint, just full Ritos and there were bets just everywhere. And it was just got the digis and just game. <laughs> More or less. You- yeah. It's like, it's something, especially as I've gotten older, I've realized like, and I've started to identify as person who surfs. Uh-huh. That's how I self-identify now. <laughs> because I, the culture just is, it's abhorrent. In fact, if he came to me and he was like, I don't ever want to surf, but I want to skate. I would push him much harder into skating. Because I think skating as a subculture values like the arts and is a much more like cerebral thing than surfing. And surfing is a lot, the cerebral aspect of it is just like bullshit, like fucking eco yoga retreat, like nonsense folk music stuff. And Surfers like horrible music. It's not surfing is a really amazing thing. And almost everything attendant to it is terrible. Wait, what kind of horrible music? Just like shitty fucking folky singers, songwriters, horrible beach reggae, like slightly stupid. Do you know what that yes. is? <laughs> or like revolution or just like this garbage white guy beach reggae shit. Do you remember there was a band called the surfers with Peter King and Kelly Slater I actually kind of yeah, like that terrible. album that well, I thought was bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> almost there's two surfers who have made good music in the last 20 years. And not surprisingly, neither of them ever discusses the fact that they surf. Who? And that's Michael Cronin and Ty Siegel, both of whom are really good surfers and who would never, ever discuss it because they're intelligent people. Does Jack Johnson surf? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's- Very well, isn't it? He does that much better than the other. <laughs> a friend of mine is a guitar tech for him, but he's who, when I was thinking, how hard is that job? <laughs> I don't know. You can plug in a tailor and wait for it to go. That job is not that hard. He has like three effects. Come on. You don't need Jack. I doesn't need a guitar tech. Rochelle Kinshi wants to know um, what meals will you have you or will you prepare for Ellis? And then she says, I miss the snobby food talk and to this day can't buy a bag of avocados from Trader Joe's. I live in the Midwest and I'm trying to raise my child to eat more adventurously than I did before I started cooking. So I'm on the hunt for any meals or recipes that are kid friendly. Ellis has eaten like almost every single thing you can think of. He's already eaten it. Like he's had goat. And shit. He's had like 20 types of fish. Wow. Um, Has he had sperm sac from an uni? White children? Shirako? No, he has not. We don't really eat that here. It would be hard to buy, but I would serve it to him if I could find it. So gross. Um, He's basically had everything that's safe to eat. He's eaten it. Every type of like fish or fowl that that I would eat except for tilapia. He's never going to eat that. That's a garbage fish. Don't eat that. (laughs) Um, I, the fish are really tricky because you can't hide fish in anything. You can't, you can't braise fish. I guess you can technically braise cod, but I would say the trick is braise, you have to braise food. So whatever you want your kid to eat, you have to be prepared to eat it in a braised form. Why? Why is that so kid friendly? Because everything braised, if you braise it for long enough, turns into mush. Yeah. That's why. So like Ellis has eaten like cow hearts. Why? I just went to the butcher well, it's really good for you. It's really iron rich. It's really good for kids. But also like, I want him, if he decides he wants to eat meat, to understand like that's a really commonly eaten piece of an animal. Yeah. Just there's a stigma around it. So you go to the butcher and you're like, give me two cow hearts and you braise them for 
three hours until they fall apart and they taste like brisket. You can do the same thing with goat. You can do the same thing with any meat, put it in tomato sauce or somehow find a way to, but you have to braise everything and they will eat it. They will eat it if it's braised. Um, Amanda says, I remember some years ago, he said Megan Trainer should do a Christmas album. Do you recall saying this? I think he said she was like a walking Christmas album. Was he glad <laughs> she came out with one last year? Uh, I did say that, and I did not know she came out with a Christmas album, but I do think that she is like a human Christmas album. Megan Trainer is a human Christmas album. By the way, I like two of her songs. Her two first big hit songs, I actually think, are kind of jams. Hmm. Um, are they bops that slap? A, they are bops that slap. Yeah. I'm about them. I'm here for them. Oh, same. I'm also about that life. Have I mentioned that? No, but the audacity. I, I'm about that life. I wanted to make sure we mentioned that here. Um, but she is like, you almost couldn't be a more nondescript pop star than Megan Trainer. Like if, if you went to see Megan Trainer and someone else was playing Megan Trainer, you'd probably be like, is that Megan Trainer? <laughs> That's close enough to Megan Trainer. So Ray LaMontagne is like that. Like if you went to see him and there was another guy with a beard playing a tailor or whatever, you'd be like, is that Ray LaMontagne? It's close you, enough. I love you. Let's have some more wine. I know who Megan Trainer is, but in my head, I'm just seeing Megan McCain. And I feel like could Megan <laughs> McCain play Megan Trainer? I think she could. Honestly, if you side by each them, Megan McCain could easily become Megan Trainer. Yes. They should yes. think about that. Yeah. And Megan Trainer could also become Megan McCain. Is Megan McCain a politician? It's McCain. She's John, on The View, isn't she? Not anymore, but she was on The View. Uh, it's John McCain's daughter. But no, I know that part. I know that part. You might. I just didn't know if she was. Did you know? I don't know if this is worth bleeping. Did you know Sid McCain? Publicist at Virgin? Probably at some point. That's also John McCain's daughter. I did not know that. Yeah. 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 Um. Cool. Okay. Whitney C, but not Whitney Cummings, says, what song did he listen to on the way over or last listened to if this is on Zoom? Let's find out. Um, there's no, the answer, my answer to this is going to be awful. Uh, the last three songs I listened to were All at Once, You Love Her, uh, a Lee Morgan hard bop track from the 60s. Day is Gone by Phoebe Jean and the Air Force and uh, Valentine by Snail Mail. Those are the last three songs I listened to. Where do we find the last three? Oh, Let's Sing, Let's Dance by Park Hai Jin. That's a great song. That's a big jam. Where do we find what? The la last three songs. Because I want to see what my last three are. Does it, if you pull up Apple Music, is it like somewhere? I'm just looking at what's at the top of the playlist that I made yesterday. Oh, Okay. Um, I don't, and you can see by like plays and you can sort of plays by recently. Those are the three songs that I last listened to. Um, all right. And then lastly, Tom Bossong wants to know, how did you meet Allison? Tom what? Bossong. <laughs> B-O-S-S-O-N-G. Bossong. Bossong. Uh, Bossong. Are you, are you Allison? I'm you? Allison, me. How did you meet me? Oh, a talent coordinator showed me your live stream from New York with the big glasses or whatever. Yeah. To, and then I like watched some of those and I put you on a short list to be in a show that I was shooting as on camera talent. It's an extremely unexciting story. It was a talent coordinator. Yeah. It was a talent coordinator who's, who's suggested your name to me. Who? I can't remember her name. Was she, she at worked E? worked with Andy, Annie, Annie Roberts. She worked with Annie Roberts. Huh. She was someone who worked with Annie Roberts. I thought you found me via Nicole, Noelle Hancock. Oh, maybe that's right. No. Maybe it was maybe both. Found you yeah, maybe it was both because I was following Noelle too because I thought she would be really good at TV too. Mm -hmm. But then she like moved to Jamaica or something, became like a life coach or something, right? I think she became a bartender and also writes okay, books. Okay, whatever. Same difference, right? <laughs> Same difference. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know, but the story of how we met is not super, it's not that exciting. Well, it involves okay. me, so I'm entertained by it. Right, okay. okay. My understanding was that you were following me but via Noelle because she had like linked to my website or something. Hey, it, it might be that I was following you through her and I pitched you to the talent coordinator. That might, that might have been what happened. But in any event, I think I just cold called you one day. Yes. Didn't I? Yes. Yeah. And then when I saw you... 
I was shocked for the aforementioned reasons of I had an idea in my head of what you looked like based on your voice. Did you think I was Most a heavy people think New I'm York a fat man? old guy from New York? Yeah. Did you think I was that? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> I take no offense to that. And no, and not necessarily. I just didn't think that you were going to be like young tan surfer guy. Right. When are we going to do the fuck yous? Can we do the fuck yous now? We're going to do them now. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you have some? Is there a fuck you song? No, no, mm-hmm. there's not. But uh, you'll do your hey, go fuck yourself. You'll say what it is. And then you go, so hey, so and so. And then Tony will play the drop. Can we practice? Sure. Hey, go fuck yourself. No, no it's not, not right. like that at all. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> what are we? What? I'm sorry. I feel like. Do I need so, to get so? Cued? Like, if let's say you're tell you want to tell me to go fuck myself, that you do, you give your little speech, and then at the end you go, so hey Tony, and then I play a thing. Yeah. Oh, I do it at the end. Yeah. Well, tell who, who's the first person you want to or thing you want to tell to go fuck itself. Eric Alper. Okay. So <laughs> you'll say that it's Eric Alper. Say why, and then at the end you go, so hey Eric, and then Tony will play the drop. Okay. Um, I keep wanting to say it at the beginning. It's really hard to fight the urge to do it at the beginning. Um, so I want to, so Eric Alper, I don't like, I don't know what the right verbiage is now because I feel like I'm going to blow the go fuck yourself. You know what? If you want to say it at the beginning <laughs> and at the end, that's fine. Yeah. It can be a fuck sandwich. Do you know, who, do you know who he is, Allison? I know the name, but I, I don't know. I, I, do you know I who do, he is, And Tony? I think I know exactly what you're going to say because I feel the same way. Is this a sports thing? Uh, no, no, it's not okay. a sports thing. So f- First of all, I'm very anti-rockist. Do you know this term rockism? No. I have like a real thing about like the rockist mentality of like rock and roll was the best back oh, then yeah. and these rock bands and all this shit. Eric Alper is this dude who I think purports to be a journalist who follows like 700 million people on Twitter and also has like 700 million tweet like followers. And all he does oh, yes, is I know he this. tweets out these really inane questions about rock and roll that are designed for like 60-year-old white dudes uh-huh. to respond with really obvious. Like, I'm looking at one right now. What song is amazing yet not very popular? It has like 700 likes yeah. and like 200 retweets. Here are some of the top answers. Dear God by XTC has 51 likes. That's an iconic <laughs> song, I would argue. Right up there at the very top. Two BTS songs, Helter Skelter by the Beatles. <laughs> all of these, re- and all the replies are like these 70, 60 year old white dudes who were like, I'm going to fucking turn people on to ACDC by posting this YouTube link and the Eric Alper replies. And I just think like, he's like the antithesis of what makes music interesting. To me, like the least interesting thing about music is nostalgia. Mm-hmm. That's the least interesting thing about music. And Eric Alper is just this, like, I described him the other day. He's like Cameron Crowe with a traumatic brain injury. <laughs> he just, like, trades in the most base level of, like, let's talk rock. And all these people are like, yeah, man, you know what song changed my life? Fucking Over the Hills and Far Away by Zepp. And here's a link. And, like, first of all, you don't need to post a link to a fucking Black Sabbath song. <laughs> like, you don't, no one is going to be like, Sabbath, what's this? I'm going to click on this link. Oh, there are fucking Iron Man. Wow, who knew that was on YouTube? What the fuck is this crazy? <laughs> no one is sitting at home like, honey, I, today I was on YouTube on Eric Alper and I discovered this fucking thing called Creedence Clearwater Revival on YouTube. It's fucking crazy. They have so many great songs. Have you heard about this? Like, stop posting the fucking links. If you want to respond for some reason, this is what another thing. Sorry, I'll get to the I'll say fuck you to him in a minute. But like, this is the thing, Allison, you have to make eye contact for me on this and hear me out. Do you ever, Tony, same question, look at a stranger and go, I wonder what that person's favorite song is? Does that thought, do you ever? No, not and the really. The reason I don't do it is because, first of all, most people like terrible music. <laughs> And second of all, I don't fucking care. I don't know you. Your opinions are like, I I guess I like want you to like be an accepting kind person or whatever, Mm -hmm. but like, I don't care what you think is the like most underrated dance song of the last 20 years, (laughs) because I know, 
I don't know you. Like, it, it's not relevant to me. And this is maybe something where I like shouldn't be on Twitter. I'm like missing part of the point of Twitter. But the, the like, cr- the artistic opinions of strangers are not relevant to me. And particularly when we're talking about like, what group from the 80s had the most jams? Like, it's not interesting to me what you think. And Eric Alper, like, has probably made a tremendous amount of money asking people really obvious questions about, like, rock history. Well, I doubt he's making money off this. I think when you get to the, like, he's closing in on a million followers. I think you can monetize that shit. Um, And... And he also does interviews with people and I've, and his interviews are always that like worst kind of rock interview that are like, like the way Marin does his interviews that are like, you jammed with those cats. What was it like jamming with those cats? That, that was fucking great, man. Oh, that was great. And that's like the question. <laughs> and where does he I do like, these interviews? On Sirius. Eric Alper is on Sirius. Oh, okay. But you know, that kind of interview where yeah. it's like, there's no question. They're just like, man, I heard that record. It's good. Yeah. It's just, I love it. Yeah. That used to, that, that was the thing and that I, would uh, drive me crazy sometimes on tour, like doing it every now and then you get these people doing press that basically they would just say a statement and then go, what's that? What was that like? Yeah. yeah oh God. <laughs> and that, and Marin is always like, you jammed with those cats, man. Those, those cats. What was, what was that like with those cats? And I just like, I just, that like rockism, mm-hmm. like, rock history is the most important thing. I just like, I think it, it's like counter to what makes music interesting to me. So Eric Alper, fuck you. <laughs> oh God, we were so close. <laughs> Did I do it? No. <laughs> you don't, you don't. <laughs> what? Now you go. So, Hey, Eric Alper. Oh, so Hey, Eric Alper. Fuck. You. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Go fuck yourself. <laughs> that I, was, I already had my finger on the button. I could. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, I know what to do. Okay. So, hey, Eric Alper. Hey, 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 go, go fuck, fuck yourself. yourself. <laughs> oh, so I shouldn't say the hey. That's the problem. <laughs> That's the problem. Tony. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. It's not yeah. you. It's. I think this is an us thing because I find that I somehow have trouble communicating how this works. It's like, or is it not just me? It's, it's not it's just kind you. Of, it's kind of a complicated segment to pull off. Honestly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what should I be sending a PDF? I, I sh- honestly, I just... it should have a, it should maybe have a PDF with some of your delightfully quirky instructions about the drop down menu on the quick t- on quick time. Wait, did you find those to be delightfully quirky? I did. Yes. I can't remember what the comparison there is called like a little TP or something. Carrot. Carrot. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but like, a, would you call those instructions adorkable or acceptable? Because I don't want them to which, be. Which one's better? Acceptable. Adorkable is oh, too except, much. I would call them acceptable. Adorkable is try is trying hard. And actually, they're really. If you didn't know what you were doing with QuickTime, I'd say they're they're very didn't good. You copy and you know, paste those from me. <laughs> I did. <laughs> to, well, <laughs> to be fair, I also copied and pasted from somebody else. So. Okay. Ooh, who did we get these from? Uh, I. I believe Matt Belknap is, is uh, who had sent us email. Oh, he's got the quirky instructions. Well, let me explain. There's a few lines that I copied and pasted from Matt Belknap, I guess, that have specific, like, mention the carrot and things like that. But then I added to it. I take them from the beginning to the end, and that's all me, plus Matt Belknap, plus Tony. Okay, do you want my next one? Yes, please. Um, people who say the word POTUS Ooh. or type it. That's my next one. <laughs> Let's hear. Uh, this is not the, the amount of syllables in Biden is the same amount of syllables that are in the word POTUS. Mm. It doesn't save you any time. You're just trying to say something to prove that you know what it is. And in fact, Trump has less syllables yeah. than POTUS. You're right. So until we have a president whose name has more than two syllables. I cannot allow people to say POTUS or type POTUS in front of me. It doesn't save any time. I'm just, it only, it's only braggy. That's it. It's like, I'm a beltway insider. I know POTUS. I'm going back. When's the last time we had a three syllabler? Because, (laughs) oh yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's not that long ago. It takes longer to say Obama than it does to say POTUS. Yeah. So that's fine. And I understand SCOTUS, 
because that one does take it takes a long time to say Supreme Court of the United States yeah. or whatever. But Although no one says POTUS, that whole like, thing. You don't you don't need to say it. how about Flotus? There's no time when you can't just say Biden. What about Flotus? It doesn't mean it. Just, all you're doing is saying, like, I know what POTUS just just say Biden or the, whoever the next president is. Let's say it's Harris. Two syllables. Yeah. Right. Do you say POTUS? Do you ever type POTUS? Don't say it. Just don't do it. I've never done it. Okay. I've never done it. done it. Um, yeah. All right. So you know what to do now. Fuck, God damn. POTUS. No. <laughs> no, no, no. That wasn't right. No. <laughs> uh, do you want me to give you, you want me to, hey, it's part of do the you want program. a line reading? People who say POTUS. Hey, 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 go fuck yourself. You nailed that one. Do we have any more? I mean, those are like, those are my two headline ones, really. <laughs> I have a similar to Eric Alper one. There's an account called Pod something. I don't pod. I don't know what it is, but they have like a big festival also, but it's like pod something. And they tweet out these really, to me, somewhat inane, I'm sorry, open-ended podcasting questions. Like the one today was like, what's changed since you began podcasting? And things of that ilk. Um, what do you like? like- it's, for, it's for pod creators. I don't know who it's for. But like I was looking at who responded and it's just like a bunch of tiny podcasts. Yeah. Oh, Dropping hammers. <laughs> I that to me was I was being restrained because I was gonna say how many followers these accounts had and I'm like I'm not even gonna do I'm not gonna do that. Tiny podcast. They're tiny Ouch. based on their follower count and that I've never heard of them. These ones couldn't crush me like yours could. Um or it'll be like, what do you like best about podcasting? But you know, and then I think like what darkness resides in my heart that I hate that so much? Like, so people want to like just have inane conversations on Twitter. Who cares? Occasionally, uh, it, for a while, I was responding, but in like a really trolly kind of way. And then I'm just like, what am I doing? This is like Allison. Yeah, we have. First of all, you over engage. You know this, right? No, you over engage with trolls. All oh right? yeah, I know that. It's mystifying to me. I know. I, I like it's, it's I know you as like an extremely intelligent person. And it's mystifying to me how much you engage. Say more. It, at, at any point in this engagement, have you ever felt like, did you ever go, oh, I did it. I, I won. I feel good. Has that ever happened? No. Yeah. But it's, mis- yeah, go it's ahead. mystifying to me. We also, I don't want to be remiss to mention this. We have a mutual fuck you. We do. Um, overheard in LA. Oh my God. Wait, hang we on. both. Just real fast. I was tro- so yes, hey, right, so hey, stupid podcasting account. <laughs> hey, hey, no, you don't say hey. Go hey is part yourself. of the sentence. Well, the way I do. So the when way- you do that, you're going hey, and then hey, then the drop says hey. You just say stupid podcasting account. Why would you say hey on top of it? I mean, that's just how I typically do it. But if you have your own way, that's great. Right. So, um, yes, overheard in L.A. They make shit up. They have to. There's no way anyone's overhearing these ridiculous, very L.A. conversations. Either that or just like and I I'm from here. I was born here and I've lived here most of my life. Either that or I just have never heard anything like that ever. I feel like the mo the closest to real anything gets on there is maybe someone says something that they think is really clever. And then they're like, I'm going to send this in. So it actually was said, but the one where I was just like, give me a fucking break. It was like overheard in LA. I teach, you know, third grade and the, the, the students were unruly. So I remade the seat chart based on their horoscope. Like no teacher did that. No one said that. Give me a fucking break. Overheard. I'm sorry. I got to say the hey. Hey, overheard in L.A. Hey, 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 go fuck yourself. Now I'm going to try it the Greg way. Overheard hold in on, L.A. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Tony, can I try it? In, can I try inverting it? Overheard in L.A. Hey, hey, <laughs> hey, go fuck yourself. But to me, that's more natural, actually, because then if you think about it in terms of a V.O., like that, your sentence is getting finished by the drop, and that, and that's to me is more natural. I hear what you're saying. There's a redundancy of haze, but my problem is, 
Oh, wait a like, minute. Like, Allison, imagine saying this to someone. Hey, but Greg. Say, hey, go fuck yourself. Say, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Yes, it's weird, right? You would say, Greg, hey, go fuck yourself. You know what? You could or do Or you this. would say, hey, Greg. So in that case, the drop would just be go fuck yourself. But I here, I've got to work around. So overheard in L.A. Wait, excuse me. So overheard in L.A. Hey, 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 hey go, go fuck yourself. I think that works. For some reason, I can't yeah. just start with the name. I got to put a so in front of it. I agree. That's fine. In fact, um, I think for a while it was so. And then at some point I got confused and switched it to hey. I did. I was telling someone this the other day that several years ago, I was in a sunglasses store in Santa Monica and a man walked in with like two bikini models on each <laughs> arm. And he stood at the doorway Wait, so there's, and he yelled. There's four bikini models. No, he had one under got each it. arm. And he stood at the doorway and he addressed the entire store and he yelled, where is Oliver Peoples? <laughs> yeah, he tweeted that. And that was the best thing I've ever seen in a lot. And that really happened. And then someone just pointed over to where like the Oliver Peoples section was and he just walked over there. That's like, maybe that's the best thing I've almost <laughs> ever seen in LA. You should send that. Where in. is Oliver Peoples? <laughs> like, it was like Schwarzenegger, like hunting someone down named Oliver Peoples. <laughs> but it was just some like asshole real estate guy who wanted new sunglasses. That's my best one. Greg Heller of Heller NATO and Heller Palooza. It's been a delight catching up with you. I'm actually going to, I want to, but I want to plug this thing. You know, I never want to plug anything. Yeah. Um, I'm like kind of proud of this podcast. I, I listened to it <clears throat> and I enjoyed it quite a bit. And I think everyone should listen to it. I think they'll enjoy it too. Well, I mean, I think the pull quote is going to be Alison Rosen calls it listenable. <laughs> I believe that's the pull quote we're going to be going with. But now, unfortunately, I can't find the email with all the dates and shit on it. Do you have it? Did I send you? You that? didn't send it to me. But while I'll, I'll do my <clears throat> my thing while you look for it, okay? okay? So, you guys, thank you so much for listening. If you like what you're hearing, please leave us a nice review. Click five stars on Apple Podcasts. That helps the podcast. Helps people find it. Um, I have been remiss, and I've forgotten to mention recently that I have an Amazon. I'm an Amazon influencer. I don't talk about it a lot, but I have an Amazon store. I have an Amazon shop. You can go see um, stuff I recommend, my makeup stuff, podcasting equipment, Daniel stuff, kids stuff, etc. Go to Amazon.com slash shop. Podcasting equipment. <laughs> Some people, you know, I always... Is there like a heavy demand to see your gear? <laughs> surprisingly not because i to <laughs> right. me i'm like that is gonna like that's a door buster like that's gonna bring them in because they are gonna want to know what do i use to create this podcast and i don't think anyone gives a fuck but i'm always surprised they don't so i keep mentioning it because one day someone's gonna want to know what is tom york's guitar setup what is allison rosen's mic setup i have to know. i'm surprised that no one wants to know but if you are the rare person who does amazon.com slash shop slash allison rosen Amazon.com slash shop slash Allison Rosen. And then follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Allison Rosen. And I already mentioned Patreon. And also, I'm on Cameo. Greg, did you happen to find that email? I did, yes. Okay, great. So close to death. And I guess you just say like wherever podcasts are sold or whatever. Found. Starts. Oh, by the way, it's time to start just calling them shows. Do you, would you kind of agree with that? Well, I go back so and so forth. We can talk about it. We can talk about it different. We can talk about it another time. Yeah. But I like. I'm starting to think tweet should just be said and podcast should just be show. Um, they premiere October 27th with my obits episode and they drop every Wednesday for six weeks. And my home funerals episode premieres on December 1st. Nice. So, and I say this very rarely, but I will say it here. I am proud of these and I want people to listen to them. Yeah. Everyone go listen and then leave and tweet at me when you're done. And uh, what's that Twitter handle? At Eric Albert. <laughs> <laughs> and Tony, what about you? Uh, at Twitter and Instagram. At Twitter and Instagram? On Twitter and Instagram. At <laughs> Tony Thaxton. And my <laughs> podcast, Bizarre <laughs> Albums, every Tuesday. And that's all for now. Who is that? Who is Jackie that? Drop? That's Jackie Johnson. Is it really? Oh, that's great. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Greg. It was great catching up with you. Thank you guys both. Thanks for your Are we going to see you on November 1st? For sure. Oh, great. If you remind me. <laughs> okay, excellent. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. I love you. You matter. Goodbye. Bye. Hey, do you know about the Allison Rosen Show? We had a good time, but now we gotta go. Oh. 